get um, should get a recording in progress uh, warning coming up on your screens just now. Uh, Marion and James, I'll hand over to you now. Brilliant, thanks. I'm just going to try and share my screen. So let's see what happens. Uh, share screen. Okay. Have I done that right? Can you see a, a title slide? Yeah. It says children are not like cakes, disentangling school readiness. Um, thank you very much, Seth, for doing the introduction, which means we don't have to have to introduce ourselves. Uh, it's <clears throat> really nice to be along this evening, and we've we've prepared a little kind of set of thoughts about school readiness, which we hope will will intrigue and also provide a little bit of bit of challenge as well. Um, I'm going to start off, and then Marion's going to do a middle bit, and then I'm going to conclude it, and then it'll it'll be be over to you. But very excited to be here. Right. Have I managed to change a slide? Did that work for you? Where it says outline. Just a quick yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I'll carry on. So in outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about school readiness, what we're committed to, if we want to talk about school readiness. I know a lot of us don't want to. Uh, but if we do talk about school readiness, it commits us to certain ways of thinking about children and thinking about education. Marion is going to review some of the research that challenges that, that challenges those commitments and challenges the concept of school readiness. And then I'm going to conclude with the puzzle that given that it's not a great concept and difficult to define, how come it's still so influential? Why is it hard to get rid of it? And we might be able to get rid of it in our words, but it can be harder to get rid of in practice. And then we're hoping to have some discussion about resolving the research and practice tensions. So <clears throat> these are the kind of things we, we hear around the place. I hear these from, from time to time, and I'm sure you hear them sometimes uh, in different forums. And they've added a, an, an element of acuteness uh, with the pandemic still upon us and uh, people noticing children coming into P1 with gaps in their learning and gaps in their skills and some populations being more likely to have those than others. So the, the ready word is all over the way people talk about school, whether it's parents worrying if their child will be ready for school, and it's a perfectly reasonable worry, or whether it's policymakers thinking about how we improve school readiness so as to close the attainment gap. It's more explicitly in the discourse in other jurisdictions. It's actually written into some of the, the paperwork uh, in England, for example, uh, but as I'm saying, the, the concept can exist as a practice as much as words, and we'll be looking at that. So it's been a long day. I've got a cup of tea. Much to my regret, I don't have a cake. So I'm going to compensate for that by talking about cakes for a little bit. And here are some kind of cake questions. These are questions it makes sense to ask about cakes when we're making cakes. And ready questions make a lot of sense. We've got two particular questions. One of these is more of interest to me than the other one. The first one is for cake ready to go into the oven. And then the second far more important question is for cake now ready to eat. So <clears throat> here's a bit of a weird spot the difference competition. I want to try and tease out how talking about children being ready for school is very similar to how we talk about cakes being ready. And it's a bit of a cheat because I'm inviting you to say, but James, for heaven's sake, children are not cakes. And I want to use that to point out how odd it actually is to talk about school readiness when we're talking about children. It commits us to some very strange views of childhood and education. So let's do the cakes. Um, I'm talking here about a perfectly simple Victoria sandwich cake, uh, which a lot of us have been making from a very early age since we were old enough to burn our thumb uh, on, <laughs> on the cake tin. So cake making, it comes in roughly two stages. Um, stage one requires particular ingredients and tools. We need a bowl, we need a spoon, we need some scales. Unless you're into the Nigella Lawson bung everything into a food mixer school, making a cake actually requires doing things in the right order. So we might cream the, the margarine, the sugar, then we beat in the eggs and then we gently fold in the flour using a slightly different techniques. So we've got to do all these different things in stage one. And it's not ready for the oven until it's all done. If we put it in the oven before we've beaten in the eggs, it's not going to rise very well. So we know we've got to complete all these stages. And then stage two, we do something completely different. After all that care, we stick it into the oven 
And the one thing we mustn't do is then keep opening the door to see how it's doing and interfering. That's something I found really hard to learn this lesson as a child. Don't check on the cake, just put it into the oven and leave it. So when we're talking about cakes and readiness, we have a two stages and a phase change between them. Stage two is completely different to stage one. And what happens in stage one is different to stage two. And there's a definable threshold. We can say when the cake is ready for stage two, when it's ready to go into the oven. We can carry on mixing in the flour if we want to, but if we do that too much, the cake will spoil. We know when it's ready and it's ready for that phase change. So that's cakes. <clears throat> and here's a cake-like way of thinking about children, or here's a way of thinking about children as though they are like cakes. So we have a time and a space where children do particular things in a, diff in a particular way. Let's call that stage one. Let's call it ELC for the sake of argument. Then we have a phase change, not just a transition, but a transformation to a different time and space where children do other things in a different particular way. And let's call that school. So that's a transition for children that are like cakes. And I'm still inviting the retort that children are not like cakes. And again, I'm hoping to point out that this is a strange way to think about children. But if we want to talk about school readiness, it commits us to these two ways of thinking. It commits us to the idea that there are two different places which have a different curriculum and which have a different pedagogy, just like the two stages of the cake. It also commits us to the idea that children are funny beings that exist in phases. And there are clear boundaries between these. And each phase is suited to a different place. And there's a clear boundary between these phases, such that we can say that the child is ready for the second stage or they're not ready. So talking about school readiness commits us to that particular view of children and of education, which is a slightly strange view if we look at it. I want to bring out its strangeness <clears throat> using a concept called actor network theory. And I'm gonna try and explain what this is in just two slides, uh, which people who know about actor network theory will, will know that I'm doing a bit of, a bit of uh, damage to the concept. I'm kind of oversimplifying it and, and cutting corners. But I think it's really useful for understanding what's going on in the transition to school. And actor network theory really has three components, which in principle are quite simple. The first is that the world consists of lots of things and people all relating to each other in a network. Everything is all tangled up. We're all connected to each other as people, but we're also really connected to our things. And some of our things connect us to each other. That's obvious in the sense of this computer and a Zoom call, it's connecting us. But we're connected in lots of other ways. We're connected because we're all voters and we have elections. And the, the technology of a ballot box connects us all together in a network, which is called democracy. So that's the first idea, that everything's all mixed up with everything else. And if you change one thing, it might change a lot of the other things. The second key idea is that there are many different worlds going on in practice across the network. And I've said what here? Um, it's a slightly strange idea, and I'm going to illustrate that with an example in just a moment. But we know this happens intuitively. I quite often go for a walk up this glen with a friend. The friend spots birds, plants, mushrooms that I don't even see. My friend is much more tangled up with the natural world than I am. She sees different things. She's actually walking through a different glen to me. I can more or less spot a sheep and a cow. I can manage that. Uh, I can spot a midge as well. But I'm not quite in the same world. I'm quite, not quite so connected with those different objects. And then the third idea, which is an even stranger idea, is that things, objects, as well as people, have agency, have influence can change things. Now, this isn't completely mad. This isn't saying that my toaster has a mind and my toaster has a plan for the day. But what it is saying is that my toaster can influence me. My toaster can affect how I spend the day. And toaster is quite a good example. It was very topical today. My toaster has the power to make or mar my morning, depending on what happens with the morning toast. 
My toaster has particular peculiarities. It always underdoes the, third sli the first slice and it always burns the third slice and the second slice is perfectly all right. And that changes how I behave in the morning because I have to be in the kitchen for the first slice. And then I can wander off for the second slice and forget about it because it'll be fine. And then I need to be back in the kitchen watching the toaster. So the nature of my toaster changes how I act. I hope you all have perfectly well behaved toasters and are not tormented by them in the same way. But you can see how naturally we talk about objects as having influence on us, as persuading us to do things, as demanding things. What does my washing machine want from me? I'll give you a, a more <clears throat> direct example of actor network theory in action using child obesity. So suppose there's a policy decision to weigh children at school entry. What that policy decision does is it creates a world in which different things come forward and other things are less emphasized. So it creates a world where we see children in terms of their weight. It creates a world in which very bright things are our concerns about children's weight. We look at children as input output systems for calories. They input a certain number of calories, they output a certain number of calories through exercise. And we see the world as consisting of two different kinds of people, people who are okay and people who are at risk. Notice how important the scales become. So the scales become very influential things in this world created by the decision to weigh children at school entry. And so do the scores. What's less in focus? What people feel about food. It doesn't matter. Let's just tax sugar. It doesn't matter what they feel about it. Less in focus are the risks of highlighting weight scores, both creating children who are fixated on their weight and worried about their body image. Less in focus is the influence of marketing. Less in focus are things like bus timetables, which might make it difficult for families to go and buy healthy food. So it creates this world where some things are more important and other things become less important. And that's what active network theory is trying to get at. And things in this world do have agency because what do we talk about most? We talk most about the scores. We, use, we give most credence to the scales rather than people's account of their relationships with food. So that's the creation of the world. So here's the world of school readiness. As soon as we start to do school readiness in practice or to talk about it, we create this kind of world in which early learning is all about getting ready for school. It's a rehearsal for school, where school's different to early learning and childcare where being ready for school is important to improve outcomes, where school is a fixed thing that we have to be ready for, where we can say what it is to be ready, where children who are ready for school are measurably different to those who are not ready for school, and we can tell, where children are things to be measured, and we can measure them, and where there's a clear boundary between ready children and not ready children. And this is the kind of world that school readiness supports. It supports a world where nursery is at the bottom of a ladder and we effortlessly climb up that ladder through our learning and development until we're ready for the very different space of primary one. Now, we know that's not the only game in town. We have an alternative game in town, which is the world offered by realizing the ambition, which is completely differently structured. There isn't a hill between nursery and primary. Nursery and primary are on the same level. It's called an early level. There isn't a big difference between what goes on in nursery and what goes on in a developmentally sensitive primary one. And that ladder has disappeared. So we have this alternative. And one of the scariest phone calls I've ever had in my life was when Marion rang me up and said, could I think of some language about school readiness that could go into realizing the ambition? Because she really wanted to address this concept and to try and get it out of Scottish education. So here are our two worlds, here's our choice. Except in practice, it's not really a choice because in practice in Scottish education, I think we live in both of these worlds in a slightly uneasy way. And I think that the school readiness concept has a kind of magnetic attraction that starts to draw ourselves back into it. I don't want to push this too far, but let's look at some of the things we do. We buy kids' uniforms. We take pictures of them on their first day to school. We have nursery graduations. 
The word graduation comes from the Latin root, which is to do with climbing a staircase. There's lots of things we do in practice that might pull us back more towards this idea of a big phase change that's going on. And that pulls us back towards ideas of being ready for it. I'm sure we'll address some of these practice issues in, in discussion, and I'm slightly over-egging that. So what so far? So school readiness, I'm saying for the, for the on an academic side, school readiness is actually under theorized. It's just allowed to, to clomp around without being challenged in theoretical terms. I think actor network theory provides a useful way to do this. We can also see what comes with it. So fixed schools, stage children, measures and boundaries. And is this really how things are? Do we have this tussle between school readiness and the world that we're invited to live in through realizing the ambition? So Marion's going to provide some of the research that illustrates and challenges that viewpoint. Marion, do you want me to carry on clicking the slides? Is that the easiest thing? Yes, please, James, if you okay. wouldn't mind. Thank you. I have clicked. I have indeed. <laughs> okay, folks, thank you very much. Um, okay, let, let's just take the title for a start. Uh, an insidious idea, school readiness. Uh, I, I took this actually from an article which was headed up by Henry Hepburn, Lost in Transition, which was in the Test magazine in 2019. And he quotes Alan Wendy Dunlop, uh, who um, rightly challenges some of the myths around school readiness. And so I've stolen my, the title um, for this slide from, from Alan Wendy. Um, so this afternoon, I would like to try and challenge some of the beliefs and the practices that are played out on the let's prepare the child for school stage. Uh, I'm suggesting that unless we disentangle the concept that we really are in danger of messing with children's experiences in early learning and childhood and when they start school. Fennec uh, suggests that readiness is about achieving a standard, meeting a standard. So if we follow this argument, then the child becomes an object for scrutiny. James mentioned uh, that in his, his uh, opening uh, remarks about an, an object um, for interpretation and administration at the point of transition to school. Adopting such a view generates activity that seeks to validate the child's state of readiness. Can they do this? Do they know that? And if not, what happens next? So are they presumed then to be not ready? And the question then is, ready for what? So for me, this mindset seems bizarre. It seems bizarre given the existence of the Curriculum for Excellence early level, which we've mentioned. The Scottish Curriculum for Excellence, which I know many of you know on this call um, this evening, was intended as a bridge across the two sectors, ELC and primary school. It was intended as a continuous curriculum experience that we should have stopped, stopped as drawing hypothetically the child and placing them on either side of a readiness bridge. So if they get the tick in the boxes, does that mean they can cross the bridge, they can cross over because they meet the criteria, they're ready for school. This then begs the question, what do we do with the not ready child or children who start school every August? Realising the ambition proposes educators adopt a child-centred pedagogy, which recognises the here and the now for the child, that celebrates the ch child's current capabilities. So the role of the early level educator is to start with the child, to think about what, what is it I need to do to support this child to continue to grow and develop, so that the actions and the emotions and the words that we, that you use when working with our children, can easily fall into a readiness narrative. So we do need to disentangle this readiness concept so that we can perhaps reach a shared understanding or something we can um, agree on. But more importantly, what we're trying to do here is create a unified space in which to collaborate to ensure that we don't mess about with children's experiences. James, can I take the next slide, please? James mentioned in one of his opening slides about some of the places and the instances where and when we see this term trotted out. Research and practice shows us then that there is a confusion about what school readiness actually means. This creates a problem for educators, parents and staff. We hear them talk in the media about children not making the grade, 
or achieving a particular milestone in time for making the transition to school. Sue Dockett, uh, in her 20, uh, 2002 paper, she, she writes about children starting school and she asks the question, who's ready for what? Sue shares the view of other transitions researchers that the term is problematic. It's a term that is misused as well as misunderstood. And Sue's study found that different perspectives among educators and parents about what it means and how readiness is assessed. Well, opinions vary here in Scotland too, although I think it is worth mentioning that Scottish policy does not actually write in, in real terms about readiness, which is in stark comparison to the early years foundation stage in England, which sets out specific goals that children are deemed to need, actually hold, need to achieve to be ready for school. In uh, an article, uh, again in the test, uh, according to Jessica Powell, Ofsted's Bold Beginnings document advocates for more direct teaching of skills like holding a pen, sitting at tables. This kind of external top-down pressure on early childhood provision in England has been met, quite rightly, with quite a lot of resistance. So current research would certainly show that there are comp competing perspectives which add to the complexity that we face as educators. So here we've got some of them on the slide. An interactionist perspective emphasises the family in the wider community and the part that they play in ensuring children are ready for school and schools are ready for children. It's one perspective perhaps that we might go with or not. Or we could adopt a very different approach to understanding readiness. Dr. Louise Kay from the University of Sheffield School of Education proposes uh, adopting a socio-constructivist perspective, which posits that there is no one single definition of what school readiness is, and that it is reliant on the personal beliefs of those who are actually working with the child. Realising ambition proposes a different perspective. It promotes a relational pedagogy, one that recognises the child as an individual with a unique environment and culture with strengths, knowledge, abilities, confidence, and yes, vulnerabilities and challenges. But the philosophy within realising the ambition is about taking the child from where they are now. So the child says, look at me, see me who I, for who I am and what I can do and what I need from you. Know that my learning and development's not linear and realising the ambition asks us to be responsive and intentional in our planning experiences for children providing environments, spaces and places that are ready for children. So if we go with the school readiness concept, who determines the height of the bar for readiness and whose opinion matters more? What, which one carries more weight, especially if we add into the mix external pressures of accountability on educators to conduct assessments and engage in target setting? Target setting and bean counting. How many children have achieved the early level? E's and O's by the end of June in each year. Is this really what we want to measure when we talk about readiness? Of course, we need to observe, to notice and to record and report on children's progress. We need to know their strengths and take the right action to support them and when they clearly need us to intervene or to step away. We have a tangled mess of perceptions to unravel. So to my next slide, please, James. What does school readiness mean to me as an educator? as a parent and as a child. So to answer some of those questions, I'm going to draw on some of my doctoral study research, which uh, we'll look at in the next slide, please, James. Realising the ambition says now is more important. I want to take a moment just to read some of these um, uh, data transcripts. There's one from the early years practitioner, that's the top left, one from a P1 teacher, and then two from at the bottom are from parents, a nursery parent and then a primary parent. Now, the striking thing for me that came through in the responses and the interviews from the parents was that their focus was in about well-being. They wanted to know that their child would be happy, that they would be settled, that they would know where to go and put their school bag. But they didn't talk too much about academic prowess. What nursery parents did do was that they used their social network of connections to empower them to work with the practitioners to support their child's transition to school. What the OECD 27 report says 
that there should be strong collaboration among all the actors. In other words, that collaboration, those relationships are really important between professionals and parents. What I did find though, um, was that the parents network started to diminish as the child moved from ELC into primary and by October, they had shifted their thinking. They had begun to um, think in terms of goal oriented um, activity and um, actions. They started to think about their child recognizing letters, counting, completing homework. So they were beginning to fall in line with the expectations of the <clears throat> school system. Homework, receiving and responding to communications. So it looked as if the readiness um, rhetoric was creeping into the way that they were behaving. Not something that perhaps was being picked up by the teachers, um, by one teacher, certainly in my study, and by this EYP, who did seem to think that they should be thinking about how they would support their child, uh, the children that were coming to them. So it is interesting that realising the ambition thinks more about what should be happening now rather than some of the, the constructs that we find being talked about by parents and educators. Can I move to the next slide, please, James? Yep. Because some of our actions, or some of the actions that are challenged by early years practitioners is that they, they don't think about the early learning and childcare setting being a rehearsal space for school. They don't really think about that. But actually, when you listen some of the language that is used, they fall straight into that rhetoric, rather than adding value to what children already know and can do. It isn't a rehearsal space for school. And I feel quite strongly about that, so much so that uh, in the next slide, James, if you would, this is what I think. I think that the ELC sector is not a prefabricated shed churning out homogenized children neatly packed and ready for onward transportation to the next educational conveyor belt, where on arrival they are quality assured, only for some to receive a fit for purpose sticker that confirms they can sit with their legs in a basket, carry a lunch tray without spilling the custard, and write their name legibly on a worksheet. Thankfully, this outdated new arrivals top-down mentality is firmly in the decline in Scottish schools. That train left the station a while ago. For the most part, I really do think so. And yet, if I could go to the next slide, please, James. What my data showed in my study was that our actions, emotions and words sometimes suggest something different. Let me set the scene for what was happening in this particular um, transcript that I observed. These were children who were moving from their, their playroom and they were actually physically crossing a boundary into the main building where they were sitting. And it was a space that wasn't particularly calm, but they were sitting there on a carpet with a bit of traffic going backwards and forwards. So there was a bit of fidgeting going on. So there they were um, about to take part in an activity with a nursery teacher. And the nursery teacher took the stuffed toy from the box and she reminds the child that the children that this is Twiggle and she's actually a puppet. Twiggle's helping us to think about how we feel about going to school. The nursery teacher asks children if they know why they've come over to the school and the children offered, look at her and nobody offers a response. She offers a prompt. Is it so you can become familiar with the school? Still no response from the children. When you go to school, you won't be allowed any toys. This was said to a child who was playing with a pocket he had surreptitiously brought in his pocket and was hiding under the table with. The nursery teacher removed the toy. And yet we would challenge that we are preparing children for that move, readying them for the next stage. Can I go to the next slide, please, James? Children's lives are diverse and their backgrounds mean that they experience the transition to school in different ways. My study found that children actually entered for periods of time what I call a contested space and a unified space. What happened in the contested space for children was that the, these disrupted the networks of activity, those networks that James alluded to. 
the bonds and the relationships that the child and family formed, formed over time in their ELC setting. So the child moving into a contested space, the the, the, it felt different, the spaces they occupied looked different, the rules and the systems and the expectations required a level of adjustment. Relationships required to be formed and reformed and children had to adjust to new networks with the emphasis shifted from a relational pedagogy to one where cognition and the acquisition of knowledge and accountability dominated. Consider how the not ready for school child might feel in such a space. In the unified space, however, over time, which is where the child finds themselves as they do make those adjustments, in a unified space, there was change without shock. And Aline Wendy Dunlop, in that same article I mentioned earlier, talked about change without shock. An environment where the spaces that the child occupied held a familiarity and the child had agency. In other words, they had some influence, some power over what was actually happening there. In these unified spaces, the natural voices of children are heard. Which brings me to my next slide, where I will work, touch very briefly on the work of LaRoe. I posed a question in my previous slide about parents and how they view this transition to school and that readiness um, thinking. And what Laurel found was that some disparities between classes regarding parental views and readiness. Middle class parents were more likely to push for cultivating their child's potential. A, there was a stronger fo focus, a competition almost, on acquiring knowledge compared with working class parents who leaned in the direction of a joy oriented culture of learning in a person centered culture. So to what extent do we perpetuate or not a pedagogy of natural growth, a taking the child from where they are approach? Do we weave social order into our practice or find ways to justify the weaving of academic skills into the child's play and some of the activities that we plan for our children in the months of May and June as they make that transition into the next stage? Do we prepare children for school by playing hmm. at schools? Can I take the next slide, please, James? Rostrom says child ready schools meet children as they are. He also says that children cope better in situations when educators create safe bases for them to encounter new challenges by facilitating opportunities to hold a friend's hand. That unified space. What does realising the ambition say? It says that relationships matter. It says interactions matter. And it says experiences matter. And those spaces that children occupy really matter. I'll go to the next slide, please, James. So we'll be doing the right thing if we think about readiness, if we're aware of what each child needs from us. That's what it says in Realising Ambition. These are the key messages. We'll be doing the right thing if you provide interactions, experiences and spaces that match the child's needs now, not sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. And if we balance acquisition of knowledge and skills while allowing children to follow their interests. Now, we could get into a discussion here, James, about engagement and interests, but we'll save that one. And if we create a culture where children are empowered to grow and develop emotionally, socially, and cognitively. Thank you, James, back to you. Sorry, my hand slipped on, my, on the mouse there briefly. So, I mean, Marion shows quite convincingly where school readiness lands us in problems, where it's incoherent as a concept, we don't know what it is, it's not a helpful construct, it's impossible to design, define, it distorts processes and creates problems for families. Um, we should stay at this point, this is a, a, a CIRA meeting, so if you disagree with all of that and you think school readiness is absolutely great, uh, please do feel free to offer that view when we come to the, come to the discussion and we'll be happy to, to, to debate that. But it, it kind of stinks, I'm very fond of this fish graphic, I'm using it a lot now. Um, so there's, there's something not right about the concept of school readiness, it's a bit stinky, but like the smell of fish, it's really difficult to get rid of. It persists in policy, it's there, 
in practice, and it is sure as anything very much alive in the world of research. And we want to have um, a, a suggestion for, for the world of research about uh, its role in maintaining this construct. So it's, it's kind of still with us in lots of different ways. So how come? And this is where I think thinking of it in terms of actor network theory is very helpful because it takes us away just from ideas and it encourages us to look at things. And the idea of school readiness is almost literally built into the material world. And it's built into a lot of the tools and things and practices that we use in education practice, in education policy, and in education research. So this graphic aims to show this. So let's look at practice first. We often literally have different buildings and we move from one to the other. The buildings often look very different to each other. It irons in a difference between before school and school, which is even more acute if children have experienced their ELC provision with a childminder or in an outdoor nursery or with a partner centre that isn't attached to a school. So we have different buildings, different layouts of those buildings. They're often different places, different walks to the place. We have different staffing groups with different levels of qualification, different levels of remuneration, different levels of esteem within the education system. So I've represented the teachers by the stereotypical apple and the practices that surround teachers. And I'm not sure if a happy person with the balloons is a fair representation of everyone that works in early learning and childcare, but it's pretty close to the happiness of everyone I have met who works in early learning and childcare. And we have different stuff. So school readiness is almost literally built into the furniture and the stuff that we have in these spaces that iron it in. It's also in the material of how we do education policy. So we quite rightly have concerns about inequality in society. We know that early child development is a really good space to look if we're wanting to reduce those inequalities. We look at how to close achievement gaps. And it's very natural to think in terms of calendars and significant dates and dates like August 15th or wherever it is where, where you are. These key moments in a child's life that we focus on and start to measure in policy to try and bring about changes in the distribution of stuff. And then in the world of research, we have things like the research excellence framework, where we're meant to have an impact, make a difference, have an influence on policy and an influence on people's lives. And so that will start to tie us in to some of the policy agendas. But there are other things which are slightly more subtle. Um, those of you who have the joy of searching for academic articles on different topics, you'll know that it's very useful to try and find the right keyword. It's much easier to find the articles you want if you use the right keywords. Lots of searches are keyword driven. Whether someone then downloads and reads your article, whether someone then cites your article, so you, you score more on your research framework, depends on having the right keywords. And school readiness is as sure as anything, a very, very searchable and very, very effective keyword. And then again, in research, we have all kinds of measures which are used for research purposes. We all do all kinds of regressions with them, but out of that might pop an idea of readiness very easily. Let me just illustrate this with one example. This is a paper published, I think this week or last week, actually. It's a great paper. It's a fantastic paper on how early intervention can reduce poverty related disparities in child development. They've got school readiness in the title. They've got school readiness in the abstract. They've got school readiness in the body of the article. It pushes school readiness forward as an important concept that we need to take account of. Yet I've read this article. I read it with great joy because it's a great article. And I think you could take out every single mention of school readiness and it would make not a difference to their findings, not a difference to the force of the article, not a difference to its readiness. But what it does mean is it's really, really easy to find in a search engine. It's really, really easy to cite as an article when we write our own papers on getting ready for school. So not much of that stuff, the material world is easy to change. None of those things can be changed in, in even a few years. None of them can be changed by people in this room easily. And some of the stuff we don't want to change. So there's some stuff in the chat about measuring children and, and um, uh, Marion referred to, to things like the, the SNS, whatever it's called, the standardized assessment thing. Um, okay, we can argue about the particular forms, 
But we do want to have an idea of children's learning and development because we want to know what, what to interest them in next. And we do want to reduce disadvantage. So we do want to be able to track the effects of interventions. So how do we do that, but disentangle ourselves from the notion of school readiness and all the things it brings with it about no, staged children no, no, no. and different no, 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 no. spaces? How do we disentangle ourselves as practitioners, as policymakers, and as a researcher? And I'm going to suggest in the discussion in the next 10, 15 minutes, let's resist the blue sky get out. So if only the world was completely different and nurseries and schools weren't separate and we had staff groups of parity of esteem and policymakers were completely wise and researchers didn't have to chase um, impact statistics. Let's talk about what we as practitioners and researchers living in this world, which has school readiness ironed into it, what we can do to resist it as a concept. And just before we have a discussion, I want to block off two easy escape routes. The first escape route is to say, why not have a single stage going into primary, but joins together ELC and primary? Because we do, in theory, but as Marion has started to demonstrate, we don't often in practice. And I want to block off another easy looking answer, a very tempting looking answer, an answer with which I have enormous sympathy as a developmental psychologist is, okay, let's extend that stage to say seven, eight years old. Let's not have formal education before that. So we don't start academic work too early and we allow everyone to catch up and it's more developmentally appropriate. The problem with that is you can perhaps hear the ready language starting to creep in, even as I try to describe it. And here it is again, this mafia figure with his world, because we start talking about two different places with different curriculum and different pedagogy. We start talking about children existing in phases with boundaries between them. We've just moved the line from school entry to later in children's lives, which might be fine for us working in early years because we don't have to worry about it anymore, but it keeps that concept in the education system. And something we are fairly sure of is that children are not like cakes. So let's have a discussion and some questions. I completely forgot, this is my fault. I forgot to give you the handout at the beginning. So I will now put a link to the handout into the chat and I will stop sharing my screen so that we can see more of each other if I can work out how to do that. Uh, there we are. Thank you very much for listening. We're happy questions, discussions, whatever. Um, Marion will answer the questions. Um, while I look for the, the link to the handout. <laughs> Neatly sidestepped. I thought that, that, that passing in the box here was very well done, wasn't it? It's okay, no, no, I'll I be shall... back in a minute. It's just yeah. I'm, I'm, I shall I'm... ping them back to him, Liz, don't worry. I can't multitask right. and so, share well, a link. And, can I just, first of all, say thank you very much. Um, okay. As we're going through, if people want to sort of post some questions in the chat, I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, but first of all, thank you very much. It is a huge question. Uh, and as you rightly say, it's one that has no easy answers because we do always feel ourselves being pulled back. Um, and having spent years myself, both as a primary one teacher and as a teacher within a nursery setting, I remember being pulled in both directions at different times. And the pressure on practitioners and teachers and parents to kind of conform to the school readiness uh, debate is is very very strong it's very hard to get away from the sort of measuring the the test results or you know like teachers wanting to know who's the top middle and bottom groups and reading that sort of thing within weeks the first few weeks so um it is a, a really big question um so alien wendy dunlop first of all have posted uh, so testing children begs the question of what to do with the unready uh, child and margaret a uh, Sutherland came, uh, responded and said, well, also, what about the child yeah. who is ready a year before? You know, okay. so children are in a continuum. Uh, and I wondered if uh, you had any thoughts on that or if anybody wants to sort of jump in from the yeah. audience. Can I jump in first, Liz? Because I tried to answer that in the chat in a slightly clumsy way. Um, what I was sort of driving at is that both those questions exist if we accept the world that school readiness tries to give us. So the point of the reason I keep waffling on about active network theory is we can take a developmental measure, whatever it is, whether it's a language score or we're, we're measuring someone's phonological awareness or we're testing if they can independently put their coat on. We can take that measure 
And if we put it into the world of school readiness, it becomes one particular kind of thing. And it carries a lot of connotations that we don't like. If we take that measure and we put it into the world of realizing ambition, it's a different thing. It's about getting to know the child rather than fixing a set point. So part of the point where we're wanting to make tonight is it's not as simple as saying, let's back off from our measures because sometimes we need to measure, but be aware of the context in which we're doing it and the way it's entangled with the concept of readiness. And then it has unforeseen consequences like children failing and, and so on and so forth. I'm sorry to jump in there, but I, I tried to put it in the chat and I completely messed up trying to make that point because I was changing slides at the same time. Apologies, I will now pipe down. Oh, uh, I've, I've got a comment here in the, the chat from Julie Ovington, uh, who's speaking about the, the sort of neoliberal rhetoric. So that idea that uh, we're in competition and that it's continual growth and that we're seeing children as sort of future workers and future factors uh, of production, rather than actually recognising them in, you know, as themselves and seeing them in the moment and actually recognising you know, what children need very much what you were saying, James. Um, so she's saying even if the, the words developmentally appropriate begin to realign, uh, we perhaps need to consider the push and pull of documentation, you know, and what is required both from practitioners and from uh, primary one uh, teachers uh, that automatically categorise children. Liz, can I just pick up on that? And what I would sort of say there is that some of what I, I'm picking up, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, Julie, uh, is there is that need for collaboration. And, and the early level was really intended that we would be able to collaborate across the, the space that, that is somehow exists artificially between ELC and primary. And when I look, if you look at realising the ambition, we've got five C's, the five C's, and one of them is collaboration. If we think about that collaboration, about documentation and about accountability and trust, um, and I could find it um, there's, within my data transcripts, some of the language that was being used, there wasn't trust coming across in the information and the documentation that was being shared at that point of transition. So until we, we agree that we are going to trust each other, we will always be looking at something, something that's being said or documented and, and analysing it with the child in front of us. Rather than thinking about what realising the ambition asks us to do, which is to take the child as they are now. And, and whatever language we use, it's about thinking about the planning, it's about the curriculum, it's about the experiences that we offer for those children based on where they are at this moment. James, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I just add to that, but um, I, I take Judy's point about, about neoliberal rhetoric. I think some of these things can, can, can function even in, in, in other um, political systems. But I think that one of the claims, I think, of the kind of cultural model of development that's in realising the ambition is that if we do that, if we stand back from the particulars and so on and respond to the child as we see them, lo and behold, 11 years later, the system will be outputting children who are doing better than if we try to do it on purpose, if, if you see what I mean. We're going to get the ease and those and the benchmarks and the stuff, but from a completely different process that will result in deeper learning. I think I'd like to pick you up. Mary. And James, you had said earlier, and you'd, you'd uh, mentioned about the, the difference in levels of respect and status and qualifications between teachers and practitioners. Now, that's where my research is uh, looking at. Now, I remember 10 years ago uh, working uh, within a school, and we, we must have spent about two months working as primary one teachers, nursery teachers and practitioners crafting together three primary one classes. And there was an awful lot of discussion where the practitioners were actually brought into meetings and there was a lot of conversation and you know who should go into which class. And, and it was very much a collaborative exercise. However, I have worked in other places where the practitioners feel that the reports or their, their information or their knowledge 
of these children has not been respected, has been ignored, and that it's they're, they're very much distanced from uh, the whole transition process. Um, is this something that uh, you see as being quite instrumental to school readiness debates? Liz, I'm not. I'm not sure that, uh, that I, I am seeing that. Um, I, I think there is a, a, a deeper issue here around status uh, of the early years workforce, and it's an area that I don't necessarily want to get into this evening. But I do think that that parity of um, valuing and the credibility that the ELC workforce ought to have, because many may not have loads of badges attached to them, uh, but what they do have is a real depth of knowledge and understanding of children and um, pedagogy. And I'm going to pick up on a, a point that was made there by Elizabeth, it's kind of disappearing off my screen. Yeah, so it's an, it's an interesting yeah. point. Isn't it? So the, how do we define what the child needs now? We do that through observations, through noticing, through conversations, and that, mm. that shapes and influences our planning. Yeah. And, and whether we set a target within that or a notion of the child helps to set their own mm. targets, then, then yeah. maybe, yes, that's an area that, that we could stray into. James, you yeah. want to pick up? Uh, yeah, because I'm, I'm desperate again to put this in actor network theory terms because what is a target? And I don't mean what's smart and stuff. I mean, what is the ontology of target? What is its significance? and valence in our world because in a i mean just to borrow a thing briefly in the neoliberal world the target is a hard target it's something you've got to achieve and you fail if you don't and we're committed to it in a different world exactly the same i'm going to call it an aspiration just to notice the difference uh, is a different thing it's a softer thing you might end up taking a different route and that's okay and within our culture we've got a whole bunch of things that we want children eventually to be able to join in and they will and we're not necessarily, we can say the same thing, which is, I would like you to be able to count to five. And in one world, it's a hard target with accountability. And I'm suggesting that's the school readiness world, you know, sort of mafia, gangster uh, image. In another world, where we're in a responsive developmental education system, it's not a hard accountable target. It's saying, this is the sort of thing which we do, is it important to us, and it, and it would be good when you come to it. It has a different status and it's treated differently, but, and this is part of our point, that is very vulnerable to being pulled back into the hard ne neoliberal accountability target thing. And its ontology is very fragile. And we're suggesting that's because of a lot of things in our physical setup, which is why it takes a constant effort to resist it. And I just want to make the same point about some of the conversations about transition in the bar. We talk about transition as though we know what it is. We talk about transition as though it has a right to exist. Transition isn't a thing. It's, it's, it's not part of the universe like the sun is or the moon. Transition is something we have created. And then we produce a whole mass of theory and practice about trying to overcome barriers, which we have built in ourselves. So I think when we talk about managing transitions and so on, we've got to do the critical step about how come we're having to do all this work in the first place and what is it telling us about the kind of world we're building around children. I think that uh, just brings us through it. We're going to have to wrap up uh, quite quickly now. Um, I do like how you actually have brought in the materiality of the world and sort of looking at policy and, you know, the whole idea of transitions as something that we have actually created. And I think that's something that uh, people are just beginning to uh, spend more time thinking about how uh, sort of the materiality of the world, the structures, uh, the buildings and such likes actually affect how we interact, you know, and that has an effect on our children. So I, you know, I'd like maybe just a couple of moments on that and then I'll hand over to, to Shad. If we've got time, we might not have time. James, do you want to come back on, on that comment from Liz? 
I was I was just busy uh, to, sorry, to Wendy on the chat. I'm so sorry, I completely missed it. Likewise, I'm sorry. I was in transition, lost in transition, I, reading the chat. I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was in the chat. <laughs> Thank you, pardon. No, that's okay. I was just sort of uh, commenting the fact that actually you're introducing yeah. ideas of the materiality. materiality. Yeah, uh, and yeah. that is something that maybe quite a lot of the audience may mm. not actually be particularly familiar with. And yeah. it is something that more and more of us are actually including in our research and practice. So yeah. I was just yeah, commenting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thank so you that's, very that's, much. That's kind of meta point. Of yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Liz. Um, and that's a brilliant time to end the session. I think we've got enough comments in the chat to go for another hour. Uh, okay. we, we won't do that. Mm. Um, James, I don't know if you want to paste your slides in the chat again. I think they've been lost. Yes, let me put that link. Uh, here's the handout again. And we can uh, email them out to attendees afterwards. If anyone has trouble, just pop over of us an email and we can we can send it to you directly. Um, but all that's left to say now is a really big thank you for Marianne and James for presenting today. It's been a really, really insightful session. I hope you can all join me uh, in clapping hands and saying thank you in the chat. <laughs> um, so the next CIRA Early Years Network event will be in November. Those of you who are part of the mailing list will be able to see details first and you can follow us on Twitter at CIRA underscore EY. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today and we hope you've really enjoyed the session uh, and we look forward to welcoming you back soon.